All right, this is concept two notes on plant reproduction. So we're gonna get a little bit more into how plants are able to reproduce. We kind of touched on this in the concept one notes on plant structure, specifically when we talked about the structure of flowers, which is the reproductive structure of angiosperms, but we're gonna talk about it a bit more in detail here. So an important overview of something that is unique to plants is that all plant life cycles have this feature called an alternation of generations. And this started at the very beginning with the first photosynthetic organisms of algae. Um, the generations were just really similar, whereas they're much more differentiated in land plants, as we're going to see as we kind of look into that more. So what this means is in a plant's life cycle, it has two stages. It has a multicellular generation um, where it's diploid, and this is considered the sporophyte generation. And sporophyte breaks down, into, that word breaks down into spore plant, meaning this is the plant and the time in the plant's life cycle that it's going to make spores. And then it has another multicellular generation where it is haploid, um, and this is called the gametophyte stage. So that's breaking down to mean gamete, gamete plant meaning a plant that will make gametes that will eventually fuse to form a zygote in fertilization. If you remember from our genetics units, diploid means two full sets of chromosomes and haploid means one set of chromosomes. So just a little refresher on those words. Remember, the gametophyte is going to make gametes and your gametes are your sex cells, your egg and sperm. And these are produced from the haploid gametophyte during mitosis. So if you remember, mitosis makes identical copies of cells. Um, it's an asexual process. And the mitosis is going to take that gametophyte that is already haploid, and it's going to make gametes, which are also going to be haploid cells. Now, meiosis is going to make spores that are going to then develop into haploid multicellular organisms. So... It's a little bit tricky because it's so different from us, but hopefully this next diagram is going to help break this down a little bit simpler for you. All right, so let's look at this diagram. We're just going to start by looking at the gametophyte generation. So the gametophyte, it's multicellular, so there's more than one cell in this organism, but they are haploid. They all only have one set of chromosomes. So when these cells undergo mitosis, they're going to make identical haploid cells because they're already haploid. And these are the gametes. These are the egg and sperm. Now, when fertilization occurs, an egg and a sperm, those gametes will fuse. And now I have one set from the egg, one set of chromosomes from the sperm, those fuse. I now have the diploid zygote. That zygote is going to undergo mitosis just like a zygote in us would and create identical cells, and that's what's gonna make a multicellular embryo that can then grow and develop. This embryo is gonna develop into a mature sporophyte. So the sporophyte generation is the multicellular, and it's diploid because it has the two sets of chromosomes from the egg and sperm fusing and fertilization. Now, sporophyte cells called sporangia will undergo meiosis, and that is going to cut the chromosome number in half, and that's where we get our haploid cells called spores. So we're now in this haploid part of the diagram. Spores can germinate, um, meaning grow and develop, and they can create identical copies of themselves which will grow and form the gametophyte, which is the multicellular haploid organism. And then this cycle kind of starts over. Now, in this picture, I have it showing like 50-50, like half of the organism's life cycle is sporophyte, the other half is gametophyte. And that's not the case, and it depends on the type of plant. So we're going to kind of look at the different categories of plants and how they go through the alternation of generations differently. So first, reproduction in non-vascular plants. That's our mosses and our liverworts and our hornworts, all of those that do not have xylem and phloem. Their life cycle is gametophyte dominated. So it's mainly in this part of the cycle. The sporophyte part is reduced. So water, if you remember from our, we introduced this before, it, that's the facilitator of this. It's gonna carry sperm from a male gametophyte 
to the female gametophyte to allow this fertilization to happen here. After that, when the sporophyte forms from mitosis, after that embryo has formed because the zygote has got, got undergone mitosis and now we have this multicellular organism, it's going to remain attached to the gametophyte. So they stay close together because it's relying on that gametophyte for water and nutrients. Now, once it's done meiosis and it's created spores, those will be dispersed via water again. So water is our main facilitator. They can go through the air if there's enough humidity and moisture, um, which is interesting. But once they have been dispersed, then they can germinate, and that's going to yield even more gametophytes, and the cycle is going to keep just continuing. But again, it's gametophyte-dominated. Now, moving into vascular plants, we're going to look at seedless vascular plants first, like ferns. Remember, they are the simplest vascular plants. They do have that vascular tissue, but they do resemble a lot of the properties of non-vascular plants because of their simplicity of structure. These, again, are most similar to non-vascular. However, big difference here is they are sporophyte dominated. So if we were looking at that diagram, they're spending a lot of their life cycle in that sporophyte. That's what we're considering here. Spores made by the sporophyte meiosis are going to grow on the underside of the fern's leaf, and then they get released in order to find a moist patch of ground that they're able to germinate on in order to produce gametophytes. They create tiny gametophytes from mitosis, and they, these have male and female reproductive organs and on the underside of the leaf. The sperm on one side will find an egg on the other side, and they'll fuse, and that's during fertilization, and that's how the zygote forms, which will then develop back into the sporophyte, and the cycle continues. So very, very sporophyte dominated. Now, gymnosperms and angiosperms, their reproduction gets a little bit more differentiated and a little bit more complex because they have seeds and gymnosperms use cones and remember angiosperms are going to use flowers but the seeds are are really important here. Gymnosperms are also sporophyte dominated. Their key reproductive structures are going to be their cones and pollen. So pollen grains and the pollen are going to carry sperm from male cones that are at the bottom of a tree. They're going to move those upward to fertilize eggs and ovules that are in the female cones that are more towards the top of a tree. Once these fertilize, we get a naked seed that's going to grow. And we call it naked because they're exposed. They um, are on the outside in the upper parts of the cone um, and super reduced gametophytes. But they are that's why they're considered naked because they're kind of on the top there. And then later, those seeds will ripen and become a mature plant. The seed provides key nutrients and protection for the growing plant that is inside it. So that's really important structure. Gymnosperms do not need water to reproduce like the seedless vascular do. So that's a key differentiation from the plants like ferns. Instead, their pollen tend to get dispersed by wind, and that's what can carry it um, upwards to the ovules and the female cones. Now, angiosperms. Obviously, we're going to talk about flowers here and fruit because those are really critical in angiosperms. They, too, are sporophyte dominated. Every part of the plant is actually the sporophyte, except for the pollen, which is the male gametophyte, and the ovum, which is the female gametophyte in the flower. But everything else is considered sporophyte. The key reproductive structure that we went over in detail in Concept 1 is the flower. These angiosperms don't need wind or water to spread pollen because of the flower structure. They're going to utilize some pollination strategies that attract other organisms like animals to spread their pollen to other ovules for them. After fertilization, when the egg and the sperm meet, the ovule swells up and becomes a seed, which is again going to provide nourishment for the growing plant. The ovary grows around the seed and protects it. And once that ripens, that becomes the fruit. So fruit is anything the ovary turns into. And remember, the ovary is that protection around the seed. That's really important that you understand that definition of a fruit because the botanical definition of a fruit is much different from our grocery store definition of a fruit. So to see if you really understand that, we're going to pause and play a little game called Fruit or Not. 
um, and then we'll come back to the notes. But for the sake of the video, I'm going to keep pressing on. Two last things I want to mention very briefly because you're going to do an activity that's going to allow you to explore this more. But um, some pollination strategies. So pollination is when water, wind, or other organisms carry pollen from one plant to another in order to facilitate and make fertilization possible of that egg and sperm meeting and fusing to form a zygote. Now, fertilization is going to lead to seed development, which is going to lead later to fruit development in angiosperms and thus seed dispersal in flowering plants. We'll talk about that more in the next slide. Angiosperms have unique adaptations to allow them to use a variety of pollination strategies for their specific environments, such as their color or the shape of their petals. These are all things that you're going to explore in your Create a Flower activity. Okay, last thing I want to briefly mention is seed dispersal strategies. So this is the movement of seeds away from the parent plant. Now, why would a parent plant not want their offspring near them? Well, they're going to be competing for resources with their offspring. If their seeds fall right next to them and start germinating and develop into this mature plant, now they are both competing for the same water, the same sunlight, the same nutrients in the soil. So they want to send their seeds far away so that they can survive, but also their seeds can develop into plants that can survive also. So there's a bunch of different methods to do this, and here are a couple different pictures. Um, that we have. So we can have different organisms eating the fruit that ha contains the seeds and then flying or walking away and, and spreading that elsewhere as they release waste. Um, their seeds can travel via water, they can travel via wind, they can attach onto an organism and then be spread that way. So there's a bunch of different methods by which they spread their seeds in order for them to germinate away from them. But that is just a brief touch on some of that. All right, and that is your overview of plant reproductive strategies.